This morning, we are continuing our series, Turning Point, and we're looking at bouncing back from breakdown. And we are in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 19, and it is the story of Elijah. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of God came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very jealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimish, king of Israel. Anoint Elijah, son of Jehoshaphat, from Abiel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. All those knees have not bowed down to Baal. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Jehoshaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Oh, I don't know how you're doing this morning. Amid this pandemic, I used to have a, a friend in college, and whenever he was having a really bad day, he'd come in and say, you know, I'm feeling so low, they'd have to jack me up to bury me. <laughs> uh, and then he'd proceed to tell all about the things that went wrong in his uh, day or that week and share with us, and there was always a sense of humor. But the truth is, he was having a really, really bad week. Have you ever had a a bad week? Have you ever had a moment when you felt so low that they'd have to jack you up to bury you? Now, the good thing about him was he was willing to share it. Now, he had to make it funny, I think, because he was a really macho kind of guy, and so that was the only way maybe that he could share that. But if you know someone who just bottled up all the darkness inside of them, maybe you've had a a chapter in your life that was a a dark night of the soul. And maybe you're even going through a chapter right now. And maybe you've known, certainly you've known people who've had a moment when their life seemed so bleak and so dark, they decided to take their own life. It's a horrible thing. I know for my daughter and I, um, when Robin Williams took his life, it was just a hard moment for us. Uh, We love Robin's Robin Williams movies, we still do to this day. Uh, We love Aladdin, (laughs) even now. Uh, And we love Night at the Museum and his sense of humor, but he had a moment where he thought his life was so dark that he just didn't feel like he could go on. 
as a police chaplain, I have been at homes, unfortunately, where uh, that same thing has happened, and I know what a heartbreaking moment it is. And you probably know someone or have known someone who's been in that same moment and wondered, what can I do for someone wrestling with depression? Maybe it's not that dark, but just a chapter of depression. If you yourself have been in that moment in uh, what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul, or know someone who's going through that, then I think this chapter in God's Word has a lot to say to us this morning. And I know a lot of times we want to just be perky Sunday morning, but sometimes we just got to be real, okay? Because I know right now, I mean, this pandemic with a lot of people being shut down, a lot of people being out of work, um, illness, um, people wrestling with this, um, there are some wonderful blimps of joy in our lives, but there also is a lot of darkness out there. And so I want to walk back into this story this morning. And the first thing I want to say is you probably know about Elijah. I mean, this guy has one of the most storied pasts in all the Bible, in all the prophets, right? Uh, he was the person who was kind of like the forerunner of John the Baptist. You know, had this kind of camel's hair and this uh, leather, big leather belt, we're told. I don't know if he drove a Harley or, or what it was, but he had the courage and the audacity to go up to King Ahab, this powerful king and very corrupt king, and just tell him that God was so upset at the people of Israel that it wasn't going to rain, that there was a drought that was so severe that it would just wipe out all the crops until the people turn from their wicked ways, and it happened. There is an incredible drought. Meanwhile, Elijah went out to this place in the desert, and there God fed him with ravens. God sent ravens to come and to drop food, and uh, there was a little brook there. And then at one point, God said, it's time to do something uh, new and different and good. And so Elijah went and found the widow of Zarephath and asked her for a loaf of bread. And she was destitute, and she said, listen, let me just share with you that right now I'm out gathering sticks to make a fire, and I'm going to take the last of my bread and the last of my oil, and I'm going to make a cake for my son and I, and then we have nothing left, and I believe we're going to die. And Elijah said, listen, if you'll take that flour and that oil and you make a bread and share it with me before the Lord, then I swear to you that your flour and your oil will never run out, right in the previous chapter. And it was a miraculous moment. Uh, and then Elijah goes to face down the prophets of Baal. Have you heard this in Scripture where uh, the, he says, I'm going to have this duel, this big prophetic duel, right? It's like something out of a Clint Eastwood movie. I don't know. So uh, they put these uh, uh, um, sacrificial uh, meats on this big altar and Elijah says, listen, uh, you have your gods, call down fire, and then I'll call the one true God, and God will burn this up. And so all the people gather around this big event, and uh, these prophets of Baal pray and pray, and Elijah begins to make fun of them because nothing is happening. He, he says, uh, maybe your, your God is out for a lunch break, or he even says, maybe your God is taking a bathroom break. I, I'm serious. It's right there in chapter 18. And he's making fun of them. And then finally, after they try and try and try, Elijah says, all right, now get out of the way. And he says, now I want you to dump water. I want you to just soak this altar. And then once they're done soaking it, then Elijah prays and God comes down in this huge fire and just burns it all up in this burst. And so Elijah wins that battle. And then Elijah says, God is going to make it rain. And so then Elijah goes up on the mountain with his servant. And he begins to pray for rain, and he asks the servant to go and check the other side of the mountain to see if there's a rain cloud on the way. And so the first time, there's nothing. And so the servant back, comes back and reports it, and Elijah prays some more and says, let's go back and check it again. Seven times he has the faith to do that. And on the seventh time, the servant says, I see a cloud, but it's only the size of a fist. And Elijah says, saddle up and ride and tell the people that it's going to rain. And before he's even in town, the floodwaters are just drenching the place with this long-needed rain. And then Elijah thinks, you know, after all this, God is going to bring a, bring a revival where people will see that God is the one true God. And so what he hears instead is a report has gone to Queen Jezebel, Ahab's wife, powerful queen, about the prophets of Baal being killed, and she says, by this time tomorrow, God strike me dead if I don't have you killed. 
And Elijah, this great prophet, has a breakdown. He has a breakdown. He has a dark night of the soul. He uh, goes into the desert, and he lets his servant go, which is like letting your staff go and giving up, okay? And he lays down by this creek, and he tells God, listen, I give up. Take my life. I give up. Take my life. He lost all hope. Uh, He was depressed. He was anxious. And it's amazing, isn't it? Because he just had all those victories. And I think that's true, too, sometimes in our life, is the biggest breakdown sometimes comes after the greatest victory. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, we don't really know, but some of the things that we know is we have a lot of adrenaline and energy. He put everything he had into this message from God and laid everything, put his life on the line, he thought, and things didn't come through the way that he thought they should, and God didn't come through the way that he thought he should, and he just had a meltdown. I love the Scriptures because they're so real, and, I, and you can check in real life this often happens. You wonder why a person has a breakdown. People say, I never saw it. Well, because sometimes you don't, because the biggest down comes after the biggest up. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. It's a lesson for us as individuals as we might face a dark night of the soul. And I think it's a lesson for us as family members might have a dark night of the soul too. And so, it isn't all about appearances. Sometimes it's about the reality underneath. The greatest ships sometimes have these small fractures in their hull that you can't see, and then when the big storm comes, they go down. And the reason for that is because of stress. And so, we have stress, and we have uh, not just the down times, we have the up times, but all takes its impact. And so, Elijah lays down by this brook, and he gives up. He lets his servants go, and he asks God to take his life. He says, my life is worthless. My life isn't there at all. And I think that if you ever feel like this, know that you're in pretty good company. For one, you're in the company of Elijah, this great prophet. But then there's this new dawn that comes, and I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And so, the Lord sends an angel to Elijah, and the angel wakes him and says, here's something to eat. And Elijah looks, and there's fresh bread baked over hot coals. And he eats and goes back to sleep. Now, I want you to notice something. The angel didn't have a lot of platitudes. The angel didn't have a pep talk. The angel said, what you really need is some cinnamon rolls and coffee. Can you say amen? Uh, Sometimes you don't need a pep talk. You just need a good B&B. And all the ladies said, Amen. You need a good bed and breakfast sometimes, and God knows that. So, the first thing that God does is God cooks. God sends an angel to cook, and you know, a good home-cooked meal can do a lot. You don't have to have all the answers for a person's depression. You got to just be there. Say, listen, I'm going to make some stew. I'm going to make some cinnamon rolls. Um, Why do you think that we cook after the loss of a loved one? Because it does help. It doesn't bring them back, but it helps, and we feel the… we have physical needs, and so God understands our physical needs, and probably when we go through something, we stop eating. We stop having anything to drink, and so this angel comes, and the angel bakes fresh bread over hot coals. Don't you love the smell of fresh baked bread? God cooks, and we can too. You can be that angel. Angel, by the way, means messenger, messenger from God. And so, you can be a messenger from God with just some good cinnamon rolls. Amen. We have some people with that ministry. And so, God cooks. God cooks. Uh, And and then, God whispers. So, uh, Elijah gets up again by this angel, and the angel gives him something to eat again. And this time, the angel has a word. It says, you need to go on a journey, and you need this meal to nourish you. And so, Elijah eats and then goes on a 40-day journey into the wilderness to Mount Horeb. You might know Mount Horeb as Mount Sinai, better known as, okay? So, he's going to the holy mountain of God where Moses was given the Ten Commandments. A lot of amazing things happen on Mount Sinai, on the mountain of God. 
And he goes on a journey in the desert for 40 days. Now, 40 days is significant in Scripture. You recall that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days in this fast. And so, 40 is a sign of uh, spiritual journey, spiritual retreat. And we all need a, a retreat. And so, God whispers. And he gets to the mountain, the mountain of Moses, and goes into a cave. And I just want to ask you this morning, where are you in your cave this morning? Are you deep in the cave? Are you deep in the darkness? And maybe there's some things. This pandemic just seems like a tunnel that won't end. Or you may know some people struggling with depression this morning or anxiety, and they just don't know what to do. They've lost a job, and and relationships are frayed and stressed and fractured, and they feel like getting, just giving up on life. And so, Elijah goes in the cave, but it's the cave of the mountain of God. And then in that moment, God whispers again to Elijah and says, why are you here? Why are you here? Now, it wasn't like God didn't know why Elijah was there, right? I mean, God knew why Elijah was there. But don't you need someone sometime to not say the words for you and just ask, hey, how are you doing? Why are you struggling? Tell me about it. And, and I want you to know that here in the Scripture embedded here, shortly thereafter, God asked the very same question again. Like I might say, as a, a psychologist too, that every good counselor asks twice because you never get the real answer the first time. You want to go deeper, right? It might be real, but the real stuff is down below. Tell me more, Elijah. And Elijah goes into this thing, says, well, I'm the only one left. (laughs) And all the miracles that have been performed and the word that I've spoken hasn't turned the people, not the drought, not the rains, not the miracle before all the prophets of Baal. I'm the only one left, and now I just want you to take my life. Even the cinnamon rolls didn't fix that. And God listens, and I think that's important. So, God listens. And I think in all of our lives, we need to know that God listens, that God is there with us to really listen to us. You don't need a person that's got all the answers. Sometimes you just need someone to listen. But you know what I'm talking about. When you're really down, you need someone just to to listen, not try to fix it all. And then God restores. He says, listen, I want you to go out, and I'm going to come by. And so, Elijah is afraid to go out of that cave, and he hears this incredible wind, a wind that shatters rocks and shakes the mountain, and then it says, the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then there's an earthquake that shakes the mountain, and it says, God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there's a fire that burns up everything, and it says God wasn't in the fire, but then it says there was a still, small voice, a whisper of God speaking to Elijah, and Elijah comes out of the cave. Sometimes it's the whisper that we need, and in that moment, God begins to whisper to Elijah that, first of all, he's not alone that God hears them, that God is there with them. And don't we need to know that God is with us? Nobody is more with us than God, Emmanuel, and Jesus come to share all of our heartaches and breakdowns and meltdowns and darkness. And then God says, listen, there's 7,000 other prophets. Sure, they're hiding in caves all around the countryside, but you're not alone. They're out there too. They're afraid and they're broken and they are depressed too. You're not alone. And then God restores His mission. God says, listen, I want you to do a few things. And God says, I want you to go anoint this king, and I want you to anoint another king. Go back the way that you came. You missed a few moments of ministry, but that's okay, because the mountain of God comes first. And then I want you to anoint this king. By the way, just by the way, we have no record that these kings were believers at all. But God says, you need to go anoint these kings. You'll never know what God's plan is up to. Don't try to decide things for God. God knows His eternal purposes. And then I want you to go and call your new successor, Elisha. And I want you to mentor him. And I think that's the way it is with us, too. God listens to us. God lets us know that He's with us in the darkness, but there's a new dawn. 
and that God has a, a plan. And God gives us not some big moments, but sometimes we need a little moment. We know that. Every good counselor knows that, and you know that too. You need some, some small wins in life. Go anoint this king, and then anoint this king, and anoint that king. Don't worry about it. I got it in control. Uh, and then we need to look to the future, and for him, it meant mentoring someone. Not mentoring Elisha because he knew everything, but because he finally knew that he didn't know everything. And that's the same thing with you and I. It's not about knowing everything. It's finally having the wisdom to know that we don't know everything and we're not big enough to handle everything, that we need God. And so that's exactly what Elisha does. He goes and anoints some kings and then he finds Elisha, this young guy that's out there in the field and he's got 12 uh, uh, yokes of oxen and all the servants are out there plowing and he's plowing too and Elijah goes up to him and throws his cloak around him and says, you're my new successor. God has called you and I'm here to mentor you. And he says, listen, I need to go tell my parents. He says, no, we're going now. And he burns up the plow and follows him. Well, there's a new chapter as he mentors this young Elisha, who becomes this courageous prophet who prays for a double portion of all that Elijah had done, and God fulfills it. And, and you and I aren't here to do everything on the planet ourselves. We're here to train other people and to honor their gifts and talents, the next generation, our children and their children, uh, our children in this church family and their children down the road. So excited we had two new additions to the church family this week. So excited about that. Uh, Chet Allen and Veronica Liu. How exciting is that? Boy and a girl. We need them both, right? And more on the way. Like So exciting. And God has fresh, exciting dreams for them. And we hope part of their future is here in this house of the Lord as we minister to the community and the country and around the world. Listen, wherever you are right now, you might be going through a dark night of the soul. Know that, that God comes to meet us. And that's why God came in Jesus Christ to come and share our darkest night, not a bunch of happy platitudes, but to share the brokenness, the humanity, to heal our failures with God's forgiveness and grace and to give us hope and to let us know that we are not alone. Because God could have just sent a message from heaven, but God came in Christ to let us know we're not alone. It was bigger than that. There's a Wonderful story that I love, you probably know it too, of John Nash, this great, uh, brilliant, genius mathematician from MIT, and they made a movie about his life called Beautiful Mind. And he was a brilliant, brilliant mathematician, but he suffered from schizophrenia. So he heard all these voices, and it was a, it was a deep struggle, and the movie's all about that struggle, but uh, towards the end of the movie, as he struggled with these dark chapters of his life, uh, someone asked him, you know, how have you learned to deal with this? And he said, you know, we all hear lots of voices, but we need to find the ones that we trust, right? And I have friends that help me find the voices to trust. And I want you to know this morning that you can trust the whisper of God. And out in the world, there's lots of Wind and earthquake and fire, real and imaginary. There's lots of thunder here and there and everywhere on TV and our phones and our texting and all this stuff. But sometimes we just need to quiet ourselves. It's okay if we're having a breakdown. Sometimes we need to break down before we get built up. But to trust that still, small whisper of God. Lily Tomlin once famously said, you know, when you talk to God, they call it prayer, but when you hear God talk to you, they call it schizophrenia. <laughs> uh, she had a way of putting things, but how do we know? How do we know? The voice of restoration, love, and forgiveness is the voice of God. I want to close with a couple of thoughts, and the first is this, that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And a lot of people wonder, and a lot of theologians have spilled a lot of ink over saying, you know, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? I mean, was he worried about what people thought? Was he worried about what the religious leaders thought and all that? You can read all about that. But I heard someone once said, you know, 
the better question is not why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night, but why was Jesus out at night? That's a good question, isn't it? I think I know the answer. I think Jesus was out at night because He knew that Nicodemus was going through a dark night. I think Jesus was out at night to let us know that when we go through a dark night of the soul, that He's there. He's there with us in our darkest night and our most broken moment. And in that moment, you have those beautiful words in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. A new dawn that lights this world and walks us into the next one when that time comes. So I don't know where you are right now, but know that Jesus is there in the darkest night, and God still whispers words of love to us. God still listens. God sends angels to cook, thank goodness, and you can be an angel too. You can be an angel to help share the word of love. I want to close with this thought. There's this story that I love from the early part of the 20th century. And uh, back then in the age of telegraph, uh, where they used Morse code, you recall, when dots and dashes went over the wires, uh, and that's how we sent news, uh, this young man went to apply for this position, opening as a telegraph operator, and sits down, and there's six or seven other people in the waiting room. There's a big sign on this closed door that says, when you're summoned, walk through the door. So the young man sits there for a while, and there's all kinds of office noise going on in there, but somehow in the midst of that office noise, this young man gets up, and he walks through the door and closes the door, and 10 minutes later or so, a manager walks out with this young man and says, listen, folks, this young man got the job. You all can leave. And other people say, what, what are you doing? Uh, w- the sign says, wait here until we're someone, and we haven't been interviewed or anything. And the manager said, well, look, let me just share this. That in the midst of all this noise, that back in the background there was a Morris code being tapped out that said, if you hear this message, walk through the door. And this young man heard the message and walked through the door. And I think in our own lives, there's lots of wind and earthquake and fire out there, but in the midst of all of it, there's still God tapping out a message in a still small whisper of love and forgiveness and grace. And know this, that in your darkest night of the soul, God is there to let you know you're not alone, to let you know that God still has a plan and a purpose, that God loves you and forgives you, and that God has a future for you. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we look at this great story of one of the greatest prophets in all the Hebrew Scriptures who just had a meltdown, but you were there with him. You were there to cook and to listen and to whisper and to bring a new plan and a purpose in his life, a plan that includes Included anointing others and calling a successor and mentoring a new generation for the next chapter in your plan and purpose. So, Lord, whatever we're going through, no matter how dark it seems, let us realize that you're right there with us. You're whispering words of love and forgiveness and restoration that you still have a plan and purpose. I knew you will walk us from this life all the way through to the final chapter of life that opens to the new dawn of your eternal promises. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.